Well, I'm delighted to say joining us for this one-to-one -one is the former Celtic manager, Martin O'Neill. Martin, uh, first and foremost, uh, would you like to be a manager nowadays? It'd be pretty tough here, yeah. There's no doubt uh, as uh, years rolled on, it was getting tougher and tougher. In many aspects, really, because um, when I was growing up as a player, uh, the manager, for better or worse, was in charge of almost everything, you know, in charge of players, obviously day-to-day -day basis and also um, managing um, managing the team, uh, responsible for transfers, all that type of thing. And uh, so I'm uh, really in control of a football club. Now they're, um, they're uh, with the, the odd exception and the odd exception being the top managers who have proved themselves winning the big, big trophies, they would have a bit more autonomy. But essentially, managers nowadays wouldn't have really have the power that uh, that others had in the past. Did you like that? Was it a, was it a stipulation that you wanted when you took over at Celtic? Yes, yeah, well, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily a stipulation. It wasn't written down. There was, um, uh, yeah, it's getting. I suppose it's getting back to the, the old Brian Clough thing. You know, you sit down and you talk about it for ten or fifteen minutes, and then decide <laughs> I was right. It was essentially, and in fairness to the um, to the people concerned at the football clubs. They wanted me to have that responsibility, uh, very much so because they felt as if, well, it, it was a sort of a trust because when you step into the job, first of all, uh, the people that employ you don't exactly know you. They don't really know what you're capable of doing or not doing, as the case may be. So they are putting a lot of trust in into you and you have to repay that trust in some aspect or other, hopefully by trying to win some football matches, maybe some trophies and things like that. But overall, it is a, it is a big trust thing. And I think that's um, essentially been eroded over the time, for better or worse. Yeah. Do you still look back now <clears throat> and, and and look at the Celtic job and think, "Wow, I just I just didn't realise how big this ship was that I was steering." Um, yeah, that that's that is really possible. I think that um, from a distance, and it was always from a distance. Of course, I. Young Celtic fans growing up because you're either Celtic or Rangers from where I was born, and um, the '67 team, of course, was was just about everything to to all of us Celtic fans. But essentially, in terms of having a, an English team, Sunderland were my 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 team, as it were, uh, because Charlie Hurley was an Irishman and he played for them, and Johnny Crosn was a Northern Ireland player for from Derry City. I loved that aspect of it, so that's where my kind of roots were. But anyway. But I'm back to Celtic, so it was always from a distance. But when you get there, you realise how big the club is, how massive it is. All right, the stand was, the, the stadium was really good, you know, from, from the pictures I would have seen from 67 days, you know, the jungle, and now being a, a massive stand. And so maybe I missed that sort of period where, where it went from, you know, from being very little to being, in term, terms of the stadium, being great again. So, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a big club. I think that the realization is not that so much I was uh, I, I wanted to to manage the football club, but was realizing how strong Rangers were at that time, and that I think if I'd really taken uh, you know done a little bit more homework about it, I think that might have frightened me a bit more, <laughs> you know. But um, particularly when Dick the advocate was was buying players, and I think he took about five or six. Um, uh, young lads from around the around the country saying these are for my, these are not for my uh, European days these are for my uh, for or my European nights these are for maybe part of the league team I thought oh that, that sounds very strong so maybe I might have concerned myself a bit more but yeah listen went with it anyway when you're a manager and you said you have to look at Celtic as a as a huge club and you, you have to guide everything suddenly there's a lot of onus on you getting a structure in place where you trust other people mm -hmm. um, who would come to you and say okay we're going to build a team here mm -hmm. there's a lot of pressure on you trying to pick the right players and and to come in and and win that treble you know did, did you was there a nervousness about it you know you suddenly you've got okay you've got a world-class player in Larson but you've got to go and buy a Sutton you've got to try and supplement what's there and make it a winning team? Yeah, well, for, first of all, uh, the, this, uh, your question really has two parts. First of all, you have to build a team around you. You're dead right. Uh, for a start, I inherited some very, very good people for a start, like Jim Henry, who was the fitness coach. Terrific, terrific guy. 
my word, if you couldn't get fit after gyms uh, uh, training you, then you had a bit of a problem. But um, but I I had uh, John Robertson with me, uh, brought John uh, up with me. I played with John, Scottish international, great, great player, brilliant player, fantastic for Nottingham Forest, one of the best ever, and a um, good friend of mine. So we went up, Steve Walford joined. Uh, Steve was an excellent coach. And I essentially, we, had, we were very, very tight-knit, really. So, and I knew that regardless of what we said to each other in, um, in the coziness of a, of a room or something like this here, that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't find itself in, the, in a newspaper or a disagreement with us in terms of an argument, things like this here. And that still stands. And that's still very, very important. But I didn't just pick them for that. I picked John for all the, all the qualities that he possessed as an assistant manager, what he could do how friendly he could become with some of the players without always bringing stories back to me. Steve Walford, excellent on the, on the training pitch, really good coach, really, really good coach. And, um, and players, yeah, you mentioned the players. Henrik coming back at that time from a broken leg, trying to get fit. Uh, Mark Viduka leaving the football club, not wanting to play. And so the money that we got for Mark to go to, he went to Leeds United. We turned it over and gave it to uh, and uh, gave it to Chelsea for Chris Sutton. Chris was having a, a rough time there, at, uh, but I knew what he could do. He was a really, really fine footballer. And as it turns out, he and Henrik struck up a great, uh, a great rapport. But we, I took, um, I took um, uh, Big Yoss, um, uh, international player. Uh, really good, very, very fast. Needed him. Didi Regat for £50,000. Bargain of the century. Bargain of the century. <laughs> uh, Alan Thompson joined uh, that not long afterwards. But some really good players at the football club as well too. So don't forget that. Who maybe just lost a little confidence, lost their way a little bit. Season before had been, you know, been pretty poor. And, um, and so confidence was very low. Hence, what was it, 21 points behind Rangers. So getting all of those things together and trying to get them quickly, I think Peter was there, was was it. I wasn't being rushed by I wasn't being rushed by the, the board or Dermot Desmond. In fact, in the contract, I think it said that you could try and win the league in the second year. You know, of my time up, I, I, I might have got that wrong. You know, memory plays some tricks on you. But uh, I don't think there was no rush then. They certainly wanted to close the gap in Rangers. But uh, to end up, as you mentioned, with the treble was um, was really yeah, stuff of dreams. When you look back in your time there, if I could take you back in a the reason, by the way, I'm not wearing my glasses. The sun's coming into my eyes, so no problem. Okay, I um, probably can't see out. <laughs> it's a bonus. Yeah. Um, if I was taking you back in a DeLorean car and saying, "Okay, mm -hmm. you can go back to any period in that Celtic time to change something." Because it rankles with you, is it? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, things that uh, absolutely. Uh, UEFA Cup final, for a start, uh, and uh, obviously the defeat uh, beaten by Motherwell in the last day of the season of, uh, of of my last time there. Even though we won the Scottish Cup the following week, uh, and that was great, and the fans turned out. And of course, it's ended up being my last game, but the Motherwell defeat is, um, you know, it's still it still burns there. And those things are actually even as I speak to you now, are more uh, in my mind than, uh, than the treble and winning. I always thought, um, you know, you have, to, you have to put family first. Um, was, there, was there a moment when your wife and said to you, look, fight, fight on, keep going? Well, I really, she, well, she'd been diagnosed earlier, about in 2004, had uh, some uh, chemotherapy and they seemed to work, but by 2005 they weren't and she needed a different set of treatment. And uh, so from that viewpoint, it was uh, it was a thing. Uh, listen, I don't know, I, mean, I can say this without fail. I mean, my, my wife absolutely loved Glasgow, loved Glasgow, absolutely loved it. And she doesn't like very many places. You know, she um, she could go to if she gets to heaven. Uh, she could complain about heaven, <laughs> but she loved Glasgow, and I did. I did, and I loved it. And I could tell you, I know the Celtic Rangers thing was big. I think it was, uh, I thought it was something brutally fantastic about it, um, and that's what I really wanted to experience as much as anything. And obviously, wanted to try and win as well, like anything else. But um, 
And of course, the, the matches at Ibrox, is, you don't look back because you know that there's just going to be uh, a load of faces staring at you and giving you abuse. But that's that's fine. But I could tell you, uh, the I could count the fingers of one hand the number of times that somebody verbally said something to me in the streets of Glasgow, you know, really. So I loved it. Great, great time. Great time. Great time in our lives, and my wife and I. And, um, and obviously, if those things had been different, uh, I, I would have stayed on it and eventually got booted out, I'm quite sure, <laughs> like anything. But, uh, yeah, great. Great, great days. Your players are now, some of them, pundits. Mm -hmm. Some of them have uh, gone on to management. Success or failure, they have to, you know, they have to take it on board, take it mm -hmm. on the chin. Um, did, you, did you have a great amount of sympathy for Neil? I spoke to him and he looks... Uh, just as if he's been revitalised again. Did you have a great amount well, that's of sympathy? Well, that's good to hear. Uh, absolutely. And not just because I signed him, not just because he was fantastic for me as a player at, uh, at Leicester City and at, um, and at Celtic, obviously, but what he did for the football club, both as a player and as a manager. And it's unlike... It, it, well, it, un, unlike seems uh, uh, um, mild words to use, be very, very unusual for Celtic fans in my time to if listen, don't get me wrong, if 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 the things are not going well in the pitch, uh, you can, you know, hurry up, get a go, you know. Hence me looking around to maybe um Larson. Hurry up, Larson, get a goal there. <laughs> and um but um no, I, I I accept all of those things. You can accept the criticism, but I thought it was really heavy handed. I thought that it and it it, it mushroomed from virtually nothing. You know, you've got social media suddenly, maybe a couple of people not even at the game, criticising the manager, his style, all that type of stuff. That's the usual thing that follows from it, you know, if you don't win the game. And of course, it was a big year because Celtic had, um, I was going for 10 in a row. All of those things probably played a part. But don't tell me for the number of competitions that that man won for the football club, that that was the sort of thing that he would be, that he would have to face. I, I, I found that from... Uh, from a, a section of Celtic fans to be, you know, pretty vitriolic, really, to tell you the truth. But uh, I, I accept the fact that I've, I've, I've been I've been around a little while. I know the fact is that some stage, at some stage or another, that um, hopefully all of that there will pass, and he will take his uh, his his rightful place in the in the pantheon of of Celtic. Uh, uh, top man. Yeah, I, I mean, the one thing that I got from him, and, and this is a, what I found so sad, was, and he, he felt the pain of it, was he said some teammates turned pundits, didn't stab him in the back. He said they stabbed me in the front. And he says, and I, and I, and I, found, I found that really difficult to deal with. And that's, you know, when you look at all the camaraderie and all that kind of a feel about it, that, I think, hurt him the most. Uh, and I'm, I'm not surprised. And funnily enough, I mentioned a couple of the players uh, about, about that, I know everybody has to make a living in this life after football, and or if it's happened to still be involved in a punditry aspect or whatever the case may be. But that's right. That 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 that, um, that can be that can be very hurtful indeed, particularly people that you know you've you know uh, you have sat in the dressing room, you've cajoled, uh, you have encouraged, you've been encouraged by these particular people as well, like everything else. And don't get me wrong, Neil Lennon was a big leader. He might not have been captain too often in, in, in my time, either at Leicester or Celtic, but he was he was essentially captain in everything but the but the word. So he was a big leader in the in the team, and uh, yeah, that's really disappointing. It's disappointing also. I, I mean, I get it. I, I I can I can laugh at it, but you know, sometimes when you leave a football club and the new manager comes in, and some of the players saying. Um, Oh, the training's much, much better now. You know, they've only been training for half an hour or something. So. And um, uh, the training's much better. It's better. And oh, there's great. Everybody's a smile in their face, all that type of nonsense. And then about five weeks later, that same player's been left out by the new manager because he's been rubbish in the first place. And anyway, he's saying, oh, things are not so good now, you know. Yeah. So you get all of that at time. But, but um, joking apart, yeah, that, it's, it's hurtful when players in the dressing room, and we had a brilliant dressing room, Brilliant dressing of different characters, different makeups. Not always people being friendly to each other. Far from it, you know. Having to quell arguments, having to start arguments, having to do all of those particular things, which I I did. 
I was actually naturally quite good at starting the <laughs> arguments. And sometimes not brilliant at finishing them, but yeah. particularly when you see the likes of Bobo Baldy or somebody this year, and I think, I better not say too much to Bobo today. You know Sutty gets a chip on his shoulder because he didn't seem to pick in Henrik too much. <laughs> I, well, strange enough, I, 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 yeah, I, I do have an answer to that there for Chris Sutton, because Henrik usually scored the goals. And, um, and it's a wee bit like one of the, uh, uh, it was a bit like... Um, uh, Curtis Davis, I think Curtis Davis was a, a player at Aston Villa. And uh, Curtis was, um, when I left the football club, he did one of those like those interviews, you know, as he's leaving the car and somebody's asking about and the new man. And he said, oh, uh, and the manager always had his favourites, to which I retorted, yeah, they were usually the best players. You know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, so overall it was, uh, it, was, uh, it was one of those things. But yeah, getting back to your point, I, I think that... Um, I think everyone to everyone to their own, whatever they have to say in the game, and that's that's fine. But if you know, I think sometimes you have to just just think about who you're sending this criticism out to, and uh, and the sort of effect, and how how you would feel if if you were in that position. You know? Yeah, I mentioned to um, Neil, he was a tactical genius when he managed to defeat Lazio home and away, and all of a sudden, suddenly he's a dud. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it, I, I, absolutely. Uh, I, I, th this is it. That's the nature of the game. That the, <laughs> excuse me. It's probably always been like that. There. It's just it seems to be, it seems to be more prominent than ever before. Um, yeah, it's funny. I mean, I was speaking not that long ago to um, I did a, a, a punditry game for um, uh, Leicester City versus Liverpool in a night game a couple of months ago, which Leicester having been hammered by Manchester City a couple of days before that. And um, and uh, Brendan Brendan Rogers taking a little bit of uh, uh, criticism for that. Then they go and beat Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool missed a penalty, and, and and Leicester fought very valiantly and strongly in the game and won. This this is only a few months ago, around about Christmas time. And uh, you know how things change. You're genius one week, then you're a mug because you're letting in set pieces. Then suddenly you go and beat Liverpool, and so it's back again. <laughs> and then three weeks later, it'll be off again. You know, you, <clears throat> I think you have to, you live with all of that during the course of the season. You try and avoid it, but sometimes as, as, sometimes you can't avoid it because yeah. it starts to gain momentum and then it starts to become fact, you know, and that's, 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 where, that's where it's hard to, it's ha hard to ignore. Yeah. And, uh, and then suddenly fact becomes what, whatever you want it to be. Well, that brings me to, to, to the point where I, this week I was absolutely aghast when, Hibbs decided to cut the cord on Sean Maloney after mm. 19 games. Mm -hmm. Sean Maloney didn't really even have a transfer window to build a team. Mm -hmm. He's left Belgium, taking a wage cut to start his managerial career, and a board just suddenly panics, mm -hmm. uh, and he's out of a job. I, I had great sympathy for him. I just think that it's become more cutthroat where there's a quick fix. Was it 19 games you had? 19. Mm, well, we've something in common, because the exact number of games I got at Nottingham Forest, and that's remarkably, we won the last three. So there's really a strange sort of thing about that. Yeah, um, the, I think that um, the owner of Nottingham Forest, I don't know what happened at, uh, at Hibs, uh, said that uh, or sent the message through to the chief executive saying that, you know, uh, the way you want to run the club like me is not the way we want to run it. I really didn't, couldn't understand that message. It doesn't really matter. But, uh, and likewise, I had two weeks of a transfer window where we picked in a couple of loan players. So I never actually bought a player for any money during my time at Nottingham Forest. So I can understand Sean, young lad, uh, trying to make his way in management there, you know, had, uh, had, uh, had worked at the, with Belgium, you know, you're working with, you know, really fine players, you know, didn't, you know, whatever the role, maybe it's clearly defined, whatever it was, I, I just don't know. But um, no, I sent him a little message. I spoke to him uh, when he was starting out there, wishing him all the very best. Said if you're ever up in Scotland that direction, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd look in. Or he said to come and look in. So it's not long, I have to say, Peter. It's not. It's not long in the job. You hardly know. You hardly, you hardly know uh, the, the the strengths and weaknesses of the youth team. You probably wouldn't have had a chance to see them play too often. You're hell bent on getting things right at uh, at the uh, at uh, at senior level which is your job but um yeah I, I i don't know i don't know the ins and outs but getting back to your point you don't get much time yeah a couple of points to finish 
what do you make of Ange Postecoglou? He's, he's brilliant. He's closing in on a title. Yeah, it's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. No doubt at all about it. Might be a bit disappointed about uh, what happened last week. Um, but uh, really terrific. And where I've got, I, I have much time for for um, for a, a lot of managers. But where I where I found that he was particularly good was came in not that well known, um, tough old start. And then you have to say and kind of stick to. I can't say principles, which is the most overused word in the game. That and uh, transition. You know, yeah. Those two, really good words. <laughs> so, um, excuse my cynicism. But uh, where I liked his beliefs then is the fact that he felt that, you know, he can get this right and just, you know, a, a, a little bit of time, just something will change for me and get, and get it right. And when I get it right, I'll get this thing going. And to his eternal credit, he did exactly that, got it going. There might be a moment where he thinks he won some match that the... That they, the, the tide turned for him. I don't know. You need to speak to him. I had, um, I I went to see them play uh, a few weeks ago when they beat Motherwell very easily at Motherwell, and um, and, a, and an afternoon game, and um, Ian Jameson, my old good friend Ian, uh, was uh, wanting uh, for us to meet. I just I would love to have done so. I haven't had the chance to do it. We'll do perhaps at the end of the season, but it was one of those where. The manager, uh, he's concentrating. He's concentrating in the game. That's the most important thing. Match day is going to be concentrating the game. You don't want any any interruptions from some unscheduled meeting that yeah. you're going to meet, regardless of who it is. And um, so I, I just said, even honestly, and I know we'll do, we'll leave it today. Another day will come. But getting back to your point again, it's done marvelously well. Really terrific. And the treble was there for a. For a moment or two, didn't happen. But if you'd asked any Celtic fan, would they take winning the league? It's been the top priority. Absolutely. Yeah, and I can't, I can't let you finish without talking about uh, the man that uh, you know. When people say to me your top interviews out with Scottish football, mm -hmm. and I always go to Cloughy because I, I, I remember landing that interview in his house mm -hmm. as if it was like the, you know, the Holy Grail. Mm -hmm. It was the best time of just listening to him waxing lyrical about you and Robbo and that great team. So what did he say? What did he say to you? Was well, he surprised? He, uh, where did you do this interview? In his house. You did it in his yeah. house? And do you know the, my favourite part of this whole story? Go on. Is you phoned me and you went, how much did he? How much did he ask of you? And I said I got him for nothing. And you said no way. <laughs> I had tea. There was biscuits and sandwiches. What did you? I said that. Didn't yeah. I? <laughs> and he was he was in great for him. And he yeah. was. It was one of those things where you were. Did he ask you about your weight? Did he? No. Well, no. He just gave me the sandwiches. <laughs> Quite happy. His <laughs> hospitality was magnificent. Okay. All right, okay. <laughs> and he no, was in his very house. In his you house. were a privileged man. Uh, I'm was, telling you. It was one of those. What year was that? When you, were... you were just about to sign a new contract. That's why I went down. Sign a new contract with Celtic. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. And fine. he said, "Get him on a new contract now before somebody steals him." And, uh, and he, he knew was, his job. He? he was glued up, and, it, and of no, course, I know. I know what you're saying. He was. Uh, to me, um, and I didn't necessarily get on with him every single day of my existence there with him, far from it on many occasions, but uh, the most charismatic manager that's ever been in the game, and uh, and I have to say, one of the very best. Uh, I remember I remember if I, I draw some sort of comparison, analogy, call it what you want, I remember listening to a, um, Stephen Henry speaking about, about his um, snooker time. And when people are asking him about, you know, um, did he ever consider himself one of the best play the best players ever played the game? He said, "Well, you know, if people are talking around the table, if I'm in the argument, I, 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 I'll be pretty well delighted." You know, which is a nice way of saying, you know, that is pretty good. So any argument about any manager that's ever been in the in the game as good as uh, well, Cloughy's up there. Yeah, and I don't. There's other managers might have won more trophies, but he's done. He's done European Cup with us, and a, per, a provincial team, if you can call it. I nearly said parochial, but per, provincial side. 
at Nottingham Forest in that sense. Derby County wins the league with Derby County. Semi-final of the, of the European Cup that, with, with them, beaten by Juventus when, you know, you wouldn't be terribly sure about uh, about um, decisions that were made in those games at that time. Yeah. And uh, so those, those particular achievements were pretty fantastic. But as we sometimes argue as players, he had one or two decent players. John Robertson. Um, <laughs> John, Tom's, he's a brilliant player. And even when uh, Cluffy said uh, in interviews, once we get that ball out to that little fat fella, and he certainly wasn't talking about <laughs> you, but, um, he meant John Roberts, and then we all felt, yeah, something will happen for us. Yeah, I love the fact that you said, as long as he was in the argument, I can remember doing a programme where we were picking our all-time Scotland eleven, mm -hmm. and I was fighting and arguing with them to try and get John Robertson in. And the fighting and arguing with who? The panel. Right, okay, to, yeah, to, yeah, to get yeah, him in, and yeah. I thought, are you kidding me? This mm -hmm. guy was a genius. Mm -hmm. He was just. Oh, yeah, I'm glad you said that, Peter. Yeah, absolutely. And because he didn't, uh, he didn't necessarily correspond to everything that uh, that uh, people thought of. You know, if if he had uh, if he had worn a, a blazer without some sort of food stain or something, they could say it might have been better. You know, but like yours, and um, but uh, anyway. <laughs> I'm only joking. I'm only joking. You're perfectly well. You know, dressed. you know. I've got seven sisters and two brothers. You will never, you'll never break the barrier. <laughs> Is it? Okay. All right. All right. Sorry, mate. But uh, no, I'm I'm in total agreement with you, Peter. I thought he was um, he was uh, brilliant. And uh, right. Okay. Uh, Jimmy Johnson. Right. Yes. Jimmy Johnson. Uh, you know, phenomenal player. So you you put Jimmy Johnson in there. Obviously, yeah. now at least you've got a club with those Anglo boys. That, you know, Sunnis and. Uh, all those, but then you go back to Dennis Law. Yes. Then you go back. Uh, you know, you Lon, I've got Lon Douglas up front. You, well, you, and honestly, you know, uh, there's so many great Scottish players since since the war. Yeah. Really, uh, like like from Dave Mackay. Dave Mackay. Dave Mackay. Uh, uh, was he in the team? Uh, uh, well, so you put your in, did you put him in your team? No. But Dave Mackay. Dave Mackay was a great player. Uh, absolutely. I know yeah. you're too young, genuinely too young to know Dave Mackay. Dave Mackay yeah. was sensational. Yeah, I did a, a couple of dinners with him, and he said to me, Peter, I was never sent off. Everybody thought I was a dirty player. Yeah. I was never he sent was off. He was one of the most skillful players. He was hard as nails. Yeah. But he's brilliant. I yeah. had go. Gorham, McGrain, Jardin. Mm. Um, I had I had Hanson and Miller, mm. maybe a mix there, mm. um, and then I had uh, Johnston, Robertson, um, Sunis, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, Baxter, and then the, the two up front. You, you could name any. So that's very very difficult. That's why I'd sometimes I, I've been asked a number of times to uh, to name your favourite. You know, sorry, your 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 best team that you played with, your best players that played against them, and all that type of stuff. So I've stayed stayed clear of that. Um, but uh, it's getting back to the point John would be in any of the arguments, and that's a real compliment. You considered the players that you're talking about, yeah, you know, Dennis Law and and those players. Jim Baxter was by the time Jim Baxter came to Sunderland and Nottingham Forest, he was probably really he was he was he, he was you know, what sort of a well, he had he had fallen from from greatness, but I I, I think his days at Rangers where he was sensational, yeah. sensational. But I didn't know no, enough about him in that sense. But uh, and he had left for us by the time I came as a young kid. But overall, yeah, John Robertson. But and for what John Robertson did, European I mean, European Cups. You have got to add what what he did on the field to to influence a game. Yeah, and John was big influence. And last point before I say goodbye, would you love to have played for Celtic? Oh, absolutely, Peter. I absolutely would have done. But the interesting thing, I'm going to tell you something. Right. And we can talk that Celtic, and I know this from the immortal Jock Steen. I met Jock Steen once in uh, in Northern Ireland. He was over visiting, uh, and it was. Uh, it was in June time, so he was over visiting uh, uh, some something he'd been invited to, and I was at at the particular function, and uh, we're watching a game, and then afterwards in in the little room, we're just having a cup of tea, and so I'm I'm speaking to him. I'm a Nottingham Forest player at the time, and we know, and we had been going really well, so I you know I felt as if well at least I can tap him on the shoulder, <laughs> and oh, he was you know he was, uh, he was uh, uh, very very pleasant, very pleasant indeed, and he said. And uh, he said, you know, we um, uh, we sent, because we, sorry, but my, my little time at the Stirley, we always kind of found out through the manager who was coming to the games. Yeah, you know, somebody scares. from Manchester City, somebody from here, somebody there. And he said, um, and he told me, 
and he and he meant it in the nicest possible way. But he, he said um, uh, when um, when we sent somebody over, he said you didn't play very well. I said I know I was crap, wasn't it really in that particular day? So the, and I think the message coming back. So he never he hadn't seen me play himself, but yeah. the scout hadn't. Uh, and um, and uh, then I think that um, I think um, a scout from Manchester City who had and um, uh, came over. I didn't play well, even though I scored two goals in the game against this team called Glenavon. I scored two in about eight minutes, and I think I'm going to get twelve here today. And then didn't and they didn't think so. Anyway, it hasn't it hasn't uh, it hasn't done me any harm. Go to Nottingham Forest and eventually. Yeah. Yeah, get success. What I take, but getting back to the point, and I actually said to George, you know, I'd love to have played, you know, because I'd seen 1967 team as a schoolboy. I was a boarder in, in Derry City at the time, and we had all um, the boarders had gathered round to watch the match that night on TV, and we saw very little television, but we were allowed to watch the final, and um, and the TV was on the blink for a lot of the time. <laughs> And one of the priests, almost like a hand of God, thumped the TV <laughs> and the picture came on about two minutes before the kickoff. And we saw it right through to the end. So those glorious nights in Lisbon, which you can remember, you can see the trees in the background. You think, it's it has been fading apart or what? Well, great, great days. So, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to have done that there. But, yeah, no, I've done the second best thing. You've done okay. Martin O'Neill, right. thank you very Pleasure. much. No problem. All right.